Hello and welcome to Oh What a Lovely Podcast, where popular culture meets the First World War. Um, we've been trailing this for what seems like months, but we've finally managed to get us all together to discuss the Red Baron. The prophecy has been fulfilled. Yeah. <laughs> Joining Jessica, Chris and I is Ingrid Sharp. Ingrid is Professor of German Cultural and Gender History at the University of Leeds. Welcome, Ingrid. Hi, thanks for having me. So do you want to start by telling us how you first became interested in, in the Red Baron? I, oddly enough, we talk about the Red Baron. I'm not sure if we should distinguish the Red Baron from, from Manfred Richthofen, but I guess we'll come to that fur, further down the line. Are, are they two different characters? Ooh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, Manfred von Richthofen was his, was his given name. He wasn't known as the Red Baron in the cradle. So uh, he, he earned that <laughs> nominative determinism very yeah, early on. Yeah, very early on. <laughs> but he was he, he he wasn't known as the Red Baron in Germany until after 1945. Um, you know his memoirs were called um, Der Rote Kampfflieger, and that's the, the the Red Battle Flyer or the Red Fighter Pilot, and, and that's more what he was known as. But then after 1945, they they picked up on the Red Baron. But I mean, as to why I was interested in him, well, I mean, you know, a lot of people have asked me that because I normally talk about women, but as Jessica and Angus both, well, and Chris, you presumably as well, you know, men also have gender. So I'm sort of really interested in looking at uh, representations of military masculinity, particularly in Germany, where it has been um, a little bit problematic and so I was very interested to see the representation of um, a fighter, a, a military man as war hero, because they're pretty thin on the ground in German culture. And at that same time, you had a couple of war films. You had uh, Dresden, which was, uh, you know, the bombing of Dresden, but from a German perspective. And the hero there was a military man, but not a German one, which I think is significant. Um, and then you, you've, you've also got um, you know, Valkyrie, uh, which has a German military men as heroes. But of course, they were trying to blow up Hitler rather than fighting battles against um, the, the British and the French. So, you know, I thought that the, it was really interesting to see how the Red Baron's iterations had, uh, it, had, had changed over the years you know, from when he was first presented to uh, an adoring public in uh, 1916, 1917, to the film, the culmination possibly of um, representation of, uh, you know, what's how is it possible to represent a German war hero who was, was also a successful military man? So that, I think, was my, my starter question. And that's that. That's how I became interested in um, the constructions of Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. Should, should we look at his arc? Is 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 I was it might be problematic. Call him heroic arc, narrative arc. So is he portrayed as a, as a hero? Well, when is he portrayed? At what point does he start in Germany to become well known? Is that sort of 1916, 17? And is he is he one of those? Uh, fabricated he- hero- heroes for a propaganda point of view for um, internal consumption? I think it's both, really, because, um, you know, there were a number of flying aces before uh, von Richthofen, and he was inspired by Oswald Bölker, who I think remained for a long time one of the most popular of the flying ace heroes. And he was, he, well, he wasn't shot down. He collided with another pilot who survived um, the crash. But Boker was, um, you know, a great hero, or rather he, he, he is presented as um, von Richthofen's great hero in his, um, the Red Battlefly, his memoirs of, of 1917. And he was determined to reach the same score and to earn the same medals and to uh, outstrip him, if possible, in in daring do. So, I mean, Boker, when he was shot down, had had 40 victories. So he'd shot down 40 enemy planes. By the time von Richthofen was shot down, he uh, had 80 accredited kills, 80 accredited victories. So, I mean, Boker was was a big name. And uh, also Max Immelmann, 
uh, was a big name as well. And then um, von Richthofen joined that constellation and then eventually out, outstripped both of those those names. So he was presented as a hero once he started downing lots of enemy planes. He was constructed in the sense that the presentation to the public of von Richthofen was guided in a particular way. He wrote his memoirs at the instructions of the propaganda ministry, or, you know, he wasn't called that in those days, but that's effective what it was, the sort of press and communications wing of, of the Air Force. And they guided him in, in certain ways. So when you, when you read the, the memoirs, you can see um, you know, a certain vision of a young man who is expressing himself in the, in the, the, you know, the blunt manner of the, the simple soldier, um, you know, the simple cavalry man, but with a code of honour. He never enters a fight without thinking it to be great fun uh, when there's a, a you know a horrible bombing raid on his aerodrome by British fighters he says oh what great fun that was they can come any night it's a presentation of a particular hero that they wanted someone who absolutely knew no fear uh, and there is evidence to suggest that there was a more thoughtful reflective character but this wasn't the best selling um book that that sold over half a million copies after it came out in 1917 so he was both constructed and also real but the problem is you don't really get a lot of access to the real historic figure because he's been overlaid by so many different constructions of, 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 of heroism at particular times. He's been utilised and he's been instrumentalised uh, in various ways. And he was so associated with National Socialism that you don't get much German scholarship um, on the, the, the figure. And, of course, his mother, she publishes her war memories. Uh, I think it's been published under Mother of Eagles, which shows you the kind of audience it's looking for. But it was published in 1937 uh, with a foreword by uh, Hermann Göring, who tried to be associated with um, von Richthofen as much as possible, even though there's not really that much evidence. You know, there, there is no conclusive evidence that they ever met. They might have been in the same room. Um, they certainly were in the same, it's a Jagdgeschwader, but, um, you know, is that a squadron? The Jagdstaffel is the smaller one with sort of just a small anyway. So, you know, he took over the squadron, but after von Richthofen's death, he wasn't there at the same time. But he spent a lot of time trying to construct, you know, almost a friendship um, with von Richthofen, you know, after, after he was no longer there to, to deny it. So he's so associated with what the National Socialists did with his memory, that it's it's even more difficult to dig beneath the surface and, and find your way to any uh, element of, of the real man. Because, you know, as we know, you're writing to your mother, you're going to present another um, Manfred von, von Richthof, and you're writing memoirs for a particular purpose. That's another Manfred von Richthofen. And then afterwards, with the, the presentation, the framing of his memoirs, which were, of course, re-released under the Nazis, that's yet another Manfred von Richthofen for particular purposes. So it's very, very difficult to say what, what's the construction, um, you know, where does the construction end and where does the real man begin? Just on the, the kind of the wartime construction of this the, the kind of the heroic version of uh, von Richthofen. My understanding is that you get very interesting kind of national tensions and differences in how the various combatants portray their fighter pilots. Because obviously, you know, the Germans lionise von Richthofen and the French do very similar with, with their pilots and the British don't. The British pilots get very upset about it because they've all got, you know, enormous egos and they see the, the French pilots ending up in the papers and like, and they want to be on the front page of the newspaper, you know, with, you know, they've shot down 15 German fighters on any given day of the week or something along those lines. But the lack of publicity for the British 
solves a problem that the French and obviously the Germans have, which is if you keep lionising these guys, but they keep you keep sending them into battle, sooner or later they're going to get shot down or something's going to happen to them. And the French, I think, in their newspapers run out of ways, basically, of saying, oh, and our heroic fighter disappeared into a cloud and became one with the sky and was never seen again, which is, you know, code for he got shot down, his plane caught on fire and he died. Um, But something, you know, suitably poetic to deal with the fact that, you know, if you create a hero and they die, is the drain on morale worse than... Or kind of you know worse than the offset of the heroic lead into it that you had over time. Um, so the British appear keen to not lionize people who are going to get killed in combat, whereas the French and clearly the Germans decide that the morale boost is worth it. With that in mind, von Richthofen gets shot down during the German spring offensives. Kind of it's it's April 1918, I think, isn't it? Um, and you know it's going all right for them at that point, but we know that it doesn't carry on going all right for a huge amount longer. Is there a, a kind of a, a noticeable reaction to the death of von Richthofen within either the German military or German society? Is there kind of like an outpouring of grief, or we must avenge him? What is the what is the response to watching a, a hero, a nationally constructed hero, die? Yeah, well. Well, I mean, what would be very interesting is to go into the archives and have a look at the the, the actual coverage. Um, so, you know, this this is sec- second hand from you know other scholars who've worked on it, but the effect on morale was was appalling. You know, at first it was reported that he was behind enemy lines, but had been taken into. You know, sort of, he, he was a prisoner of war. Then that there was some kind of skullduggery some kind of treachery around his death that he'd been seen to land and then suddenly he was dead. So how could he have landed if he'd been shot in the heart? So it must have been treachery on the ground that that killed him because they they constructed him as a national hero along the lines of Siegfried. Now Siegfried did have a vulnerability. I can't remember what it was. It wasn't the Achilles heel, but um, he, he had a, a vulnerability and um, I suppose what they tried to do was present him as having entered into the pantheon of, um, you know, the, 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 the hunting grounds beyond the skies uh, and into the pantheon of mythical German heroes. So he'd taken on almost a mythical form, you know, by the time that he was actually killed. So seeing that he was actually mortal was certainly something that, People found very difficult to take. There was um, you know, a huge, huge outpouring of grief, some desire for revenge, obviously, because of the way it had been constructed. And even today, people haven't quite made up their minds how von Richthofen died. And, you know, there are whole podcasts that could be devoted to that, but not with me um, as a guest, because I really don't know. Um, you know, it seems that it's more likely that he was shot from the ground than that he was shot down in in battle. But it doesn't seem to matter hugely. I think at the time it did, the idea that he couldn't be defeated in a fair combat in the air was quite important. So this sort of idea that he was was, um, shot close to the ground um, and that somehow he had played fair, whereas the enemy had not did quite a lot to mitigate this sort of loss of morale uh, because then there was vengeance. And I think, you know, we've t- talked about um, Nurse, Nurse Cavill uh, when when she was killed. You know, an, an awful lot of people were motivated by the way she, she died to join up. So I think there was a lot of that going on as well. But, I mean, lionising the, you know, these air aces, I think it worked for the Germans because they had very little else to report. In 1917, you know, they were outnumbered for a lot of the time. They were outclassed as well in terms of technology. So the fact that von Richthofen and his uh, flying circus was so successful, I think, was a very good story to give people back home because there weren't many other victories or there weren't really any victories that that uh, could be spoken of in in the same way so that actually leads into into the question i had which is you talked about richtofen's self-representation in his memoir 
and in the letters to his mother, which then get used in her book. I'm wondering about the press representation, and particularly the press representation that precedes the publication of his book, and to the extent to which, how, how is he being constructed by others from, you know, from the start of his, his service and up to, to that point where he starts constructing himself in their image? Well, I, th- I think his, um, his postcard was very popular. So there were a number of photographs that were taken of him so before he gets the blue max, the Paul and Merit, and, um, and, and afterwards as well, that um, von Richthofen is one of the most popular of the photographs that are being bought and, and are being sent. And there's quite a difference in what he looks like as well. He, he looks like, you know, he looks like a man who has seen death, put it that way. Um, he looks, he looks about the mid forties, although he was only 25 when he died, which, which makes it all the, uh, it's not really amusing, but it's more incongruous, shall we say, that um, the, the the boy band looking heartthrob, um, Matthias Schweighöfer, gets to play him. He is the same age, you know, uh, but he didn't look like that, uh, certainly not in in the photographs. But he was presented as he he is he is an aristocrat. Uh, he has a code of honor. The Nazis exaggerated his military background. There wasn't really that much of a military you know, pedigree in the family, but for, for, for the National Socialists, they created this whole backstory which showed that he was um, you know, born to, to fight. But he was presented, so you know, at, at the one time, this um, aristocrat with a military code of honour and enormous self-discipline and a sense of duty, but on the other, you know, a modest man, modesty, I don't think came naturally, but it's constantly there in, um, you know, that he's, 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 he's had a good old boast. And then he says, but of course, you know, I, I have done nothing but my duty. And th- there is also the self-control that we see as well. Uh, and we see that in, in the heroic mother who, when, uh, when the empress uh, says, you know, we're, we're really sorry to hear of your son's death. She says, yes. I wish he could have lived to serve the fatherland for a little longer, which, you know, is is quite heartbreaking if that really was her response. But I think it's it's probably quite unlikely. So he was presented as simple, as a soldier, as straightforward, but with this enormous code of honour, but also the sense of duty to towards the the infantryman. He, he you know he said that he was fighting for the infantryman, and that while the infantryman, um, the simple soldier, was doing his duty, then he, uh, von Richthofen, could do no other. So he, you know, partly an answer to to Chris's earlier question, they did try and get him out of the firing line. You know, they they tried to stop him flying, but, uh, or maybe this is all part of the the legend, who knows? Apparently, they tried to stop him flying. Apparently, um, you know, they they tried to bring him into safety, but he was having none of it. So while the while the infantry man is fighting there in the trenches, he must do his duty. Con- continually shifting narrative of how you're reinventing the idea of a hero and what they need for a hero at that moment. Yeah, they they need they needed someone that they could look up to almost literally. Literally, they needed a hero, but they needed a hero who understood and stood with the whole of Germany. Um, I think it's quite unlikely that he would have had a huge amount of sympathy for the simple man, unless that simple man was of service to, you know, his, his upper class. Is it Batman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, he, I mean, he, 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 was, he was very straightforward according to, Again, this is, is this part of the legend or is this true? Um, but reports say that he was very straightforward with uh, engineers and, um, you know, with technicians. And he treated people quite well. If they did their job, he treated them well um, and didn't stand on ceremony. Uh, he was also presented as being a bit of a maverick. You know, again, it's, I think, probably exaggerated to make him more attractive as a hero, someone who stood up against authority. You know, he's reported to have said, and he doesn't actually claim saying this, 
you know, he says, people say that this is what I responded when I was told to, you know, take this this job as a quartermaster or, or equivalent. You know, I did not enter this war to gather eggs and cheese, but for quite a different purpose. People say that I said that. So it's sort of he's he's playing with this image that he is a bit of a maverick. He is you know, anti-authoritarian and that he will also stand up to to the big wigs. He's so he's he's presenting himself as very much one of the people, despite everything that suggests that he probably isn't. You know, his aristocratic privilege, um, you know, and uh, training uh, as well. And his his class, uh, his, his class privilege and identification. But the way he's being presented is he's a simple man of the people. Well, I was about to say, it feels very much like if von Richthofen didn't exist, that the Germans would have had to invent him. Because, and you know, to an extent, it sounds like they, they have. But yeah, he everything about this sounds like he's got a very good spin doctor. Or the German army have, have ascribed him quite the focus group publicist to be a man for all seasons. And uh, I mean, you know, there were others too, the, the Immelmann and Boker. But it's interesting that the National Socialists didn't pick up on either Immelmann and Boker to the same degree. Because, uh, I mean, you know, it, it's, I don't know if you know the film, you know, The Four Funerals of Someone or Other, but he was, he was, he was buried, he was dug up, he was reburied, he was dug up. And, um, he's, he said, so he's, he's been buried four times, um, once by, by the enemy, uh, where, where he crashed. And then he was moved to be slightly more anonymous in the German cemetery, um, moved by the French. And then he was repatriated. They managed to negotiate and get him uh, returned to his own country in 1925. And he was supposed to be buried with his brother, who had died in 1922 um, in a commercial flight that wasn't really reported very much. I mean, I was quite surprised. I would have thought, you know, the Richthofen glamour would have continued after the war, but no one was all that interested in um, the fighter pilots and, and I think they probably had a rough time adjusting to a newly democratic a republican Germany in which their kind were an- anachronisms. I was going to ask about what happens to his reputation between the war and this you know his memoir and his death and the commemoration of that and then between that and then when he's it sounds like he's rehabilitated almost by national socialism when so is does he does he disappear from cultural view in that period in the interwar period he does you can you can see this in in his memoirs they were reissued in 1920 all uh, and no one bought it i mean absolute crickets nothing but I suppose if you bought a book in 1917, you're not going to buy the same book again um, a couple of years later. But, but you know, it's that sort of heroic image. You'd imagine, you know, prize givings and, you know, this is what you, you buy to give to, to young men who you want to aspire to serve the fatherland. And, and if he just disappears entirely, that's, that's quite an interesting way in which Germany as a culture is trying – to remember or not remember the war, I think as well because um, you know the, the the military were were not uh, you know, immediately after the war when Germany, by the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, was not allowed to have an air force and not really have much of an army. Then I think that the the army were discredited, and it took a while for them to bounce back. So in 1920, that was not the mood. They were not in the mood to read about, you know, the the exploits of um, of of uh, you know the Red Baron or, or any other um, you know unreconstructed military man. But by 1925, in the middle of you know massive culture war, I don't know if this is having resonance as well. But massive culture war, um, you know, it was quite a coup, and it was a chance to show military strength. So enough time had passed. The military had regrouped and um, made sure that the Republicans, so you know the people who had, the civilians mainly who were in charge of Germany at that time, were kept out of any of uh, any aspect of this ceremony, and it was seen as a show of strength. And in that same year, I think that was when um, Hindenburg 
was um you know he he was he was named as as a vice president which sort of opened the floodgates to you know revival of military for, fortune so that 1925 was significant and then of course under the nazis he was the ideal hero for them because of the association with hermann goering uh, because they could say that he was a pure a hero and he represented the values that they wanted in their Hitler youth. So in 1933, it was reissued and it was endorsed by no less a figure than, than Hitler himself, who, who said that he wanted this to be the role model, you know, this self-sacrificing simple man who, you know, enjoyed an adventure and, but who, who, who fought fairly. Um, and it was a way of appropriating these you know these characteristics that we don't naturally associate with national socialism with their form of, of military but while also he was bridging a gap because he was also seen as a new kind of soldier because of the you know the the importance of technology as well in his victories so it was he was bridging the past the chivalry the code of honor the self discipline the sense of service of so, so supposedly characteristic of the aristocracy and distancing himself from the rabble that had taken over Germany with this ill-fated revolution that was a stab in the back for honest Germans. And this uh, was the spirit that was being continued by representatives of the Third Reich. Um, and and Goering uh, was very much embodying that because he was a literal continuation of the um the Jagdgeschwader Richthofen into the the you know the build up to the second world war so it was making them air ready it was making them war ready by telling them the war was not what they remembered this awful humiliating defeat but was in fact you know rather a jolly adventure in which you know a man could show what he was really made of i mean this is my interpretation anyway presumably his reputations enhanced by the fact he's an international figure as well. So internally to Germany, when you can say, oh, look, Biggles is writing about, you know, Biggles faces off against the Red Baron as the bogeyman kind of figure. If you're internal to Germany, you go, well, you know, even even the British and Biggles are, are afraid of our great hero, Richthofen. Yes, he, well, he was, and he was a huge success. You know, if, you, if you're if you measuring um, success in killing the enemy, I mean, he killed a lot of the enemy, and uh, he was the ace of aces. No one, no one really, no one matched his score. But um, as a, a fairly recent German biographer has pointed out, he actually killed more people before he, you know, before he ever went to the Western Front because he 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 was enjoying himself, just sort of taking pot shots at Russian troops. But it's almost, you know, as if that doesn't count. It's only really he only really values in his memoirs British fighters he's he's constantly talking about getting the better of a worthy foe and and that was um you know the, the British fighters I think he included uh, allies as well so anglophone fighters not so much the French and I, I'm sorry for any French listeners for this but he said that the French always ran away from a fight whereas the Brits could be trusted to stand their ground and throw themselves head long yeah. <laughs> yeah get shot down which of course suited his purpose you know and and we we know that there are some some very high scoring French fighter pilots as well so you know we don't have to t- we don't have to take uh, von Richthofen's word for it just uh, before we kind of uh push forward in the time you mentioned his brother early on and his brother was also a fighter pilot wasn't he in the same squadron i can't remember what his name was it's gone completely out of my head Lothar. that's right Lothar. what is manfred von richthofen providing the german people and the press and you know the government and like that his brother isn't why is his brother or, or does his brother basically become trotted out as red baron 2.0 you know we've lost to the original but have you have you seen our younger sequel? What what is it about Manfred? That, what does Manfred have that his brother does? Well, don't forget, there's also there's a the cousin, there's uh, Wolfram, who survives the war and becomes a field marshal in the Second World War in the Luf- Luftwaffe. That's true. There was a whole little stable of um, von Richthofen. Um, yeah, the cousin, the cousin was there too. But 
I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, it's like any famous sporting brothers, like, you know, the Brown Brownlee brothers and, um, you know, Andy Murray and his slightly less famous brother. It was great propaganda value to have them in the same squadron and flying together as well. I think the rivalry in the film is exaggerated. But then, as I say, we don't really have access to... Um, the real situation. But Lothar writes very generously about his brother. He recognises his, I mean, he's he's two years older. He enters the, the fray much, much, much sooner. Um, but Manfred von Richthofen also writes, you know, in a very brotherly way about his, his younger brother. And he's, it seems very proud of him when he shoots his first enemy plane down. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, I think the rivalry is exaggerated to show um, Manfred in you know, the light of this much more sensitive hero. Uh, there, there is some evidence of that in that um, Richthofen says, well, I'm, I'm a sportsman, I'm a hunter, whereas my brother is a shooter. You know, if, I, if, I've, if I've shot down one English plane, then I'm quite happy for at least a quarter of an hour, whereas Lothar, he just can't get enough, you know. <laughs> the the whole hunting metaphor, he they 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 killed a crazy number of quite endangered species, you know, without seeming to care a huge amount. And particularly once uh, Manfred got famous, and you know, he was invited by all the crowned heads of Germany. And remember that there, there were lots of crowned heads of Germany. There were lots of little principalities there. So there was a prince from this and a prince from that. And they all invited him to go shooting. And he was shooting things like bison um, and saying, you know, it's a shame that uh, this is probably the last bison herd that they will ever be. Um, oh, I got one. You know, he didn't. <laughs> if only there was something I could do to preserve them. <laughs> But he did the same with, uh, I mean, it, it does seem quite pathological. You know, he collected trophies like a serial killer or, a, you know, or a hunter, I suppose. It was normalised to have the heads of your enemy. I don't think he was quite allowed to do that with British pilots, but he, he, he loved to get bits of their plane or their machine guns or anything he could get hold of, really. But that, that, the, 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 that's it's not similar. If you think Life, Death, Colonel Blimp, where after the war he travels around shooting everything that moves and it covers his wall of, in the film, doesn't it? It's that aristocratic collecting urge, seemingly. George V was notorious for going down to Norfolk and shooting all the birds possible. Um there's a tradition in, in, in the Air Force, isn't there, of trophy taking, and if not of actually, you know, taking bits of the plane, but certainly painting on the plane. Did that start with von Richthofen, or am I, is that a Second World War trope? I don't think they kept a score on the plane, uh, but the, the painting of the plane, it was not Richthofen's in, invention. Um, I think that people had been painting planes to individualize them but also for ease of recognition you know so that um you could tell which squadron you were supposed to be in which group you're supposed to be in but um Richthofen uh, as far as I can see was the first to paint an entire plane bright red and other planes with, within that uh, that squadron also painted themselves in bright colours. So the circus imagery was because of the bright colours, but also because they were constantly on the move, you know, that they they were a a very mobile unit who were patrolling the German lines to try and prevent um, reconnaissance. And I I think that's partly why they, they shot so many down without losing as many as they could, because they didn't follow... They didn't go seeking the flight over the British lines. They they would shoot anything that, that came over um, because they they wanted to make sure that um, you know the intelligence didn't get back as far as possible. Uh, so yes, the, I mean the, the the paint job was in January 1917 to sort of commemorate the fact that he had his own little Staffel, the Jagdstaffel Elf number eleven. Which, when he took it over, he, you know, I think, I think they said, well, you know, it's, it's quite easy to keep track of the score because it was nothing, you know, they had not Jagdstaffel Jagd eleven um, had not shot down a single plane, but he got there and he built it up and he built it up quite quickly to become something pretty, you know, pretty, pretty scary and, and pretty effective. 
he wrote a little manual as well, which uh, I think possibly um, the real von Richthofen might be detectable there. It's not written in the same, you know, isn't this a jolly lark? Um, we're all having fun together. You know, I'm one of the lads, me. Uh, it's written in quite a sober way. And he just says, I've, I've got n- no time for acrobatics. That that looks good, good. It's a trick. But what I want is people who are not scared and who will take the fight to 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 the enemy, but who also know when it's time to uh, to, to leave a fight. Um, because we, we want to kill as many as possible. We want to down as many as possible. But we can't afford to lose planes because we're outnumbered. I was about to say, um, and I think it comes from that little manual, because, I mean, you certainly see it in the, in the film and this like, kind of general idea about pilots in the first world war is, you know, it's super chivalrous, it's super honourable, you know, you've got an honourable code, you're shooting at a plane rather than a person. That is all nonsense, isn't it? Richthofen is very clear, I think, and it might be in that manual, of the easiest way to shoot down an opposing plane is get really close to it and machine gun the pilot. Um, and isn't there a line in there about taking out the observer first? Don't don't kill the pilot. Kill the observer, um, and then kill the pilot. So yeah, there's nothing. There's no. There's no chivalrous knights of the air element to that. If you're getting as close as possible and machine gunning the two guys in the plane, and there's no real chivalrous knights of the air in um, you know using the fact that you've got a plane to to just kill kill as many infantrymen as possible, which is is what he did uh, you know behind in in Russia. But then even Biggles. I mean, it's almost like um, when when Biggles gets the fighting rage, the red mist descends and he, he sort of becomes fighter Biggles. He is not satisfied until he's shot people behind the lines. He's shot at a car, you know, and it's justified because it's vengeance for, um, you know, a lost comrade or because the Germans have done something, the Bosch has done something absolutely dastardly. So, you know, they maintain this sense that they are being chivalrous while also doing the most appalling things. But I, th- I think the chivalry, you know, like, like von Richthofen, is a construct. And I'm afraid we're back to John Buchan. Sorry, sorry, Chris and Angus, this is becoming a theme. <laughs> I mean, we're also back to computer games. You know, in Mr. Standfast, the description of the air fights in that are entirely around the chivalry of the air and the glorification of Peter Pienaar as, you know, the honourable boar who, who's now taken to the air and in this new form of warfare. That's written by Buchan at the point that he's writing for Wellington House when he's deep into the propaganda narrative of the war. He's not a flyer himself, as opposed to, you know, as you said, the, the real von Richthofen is, is writing about, you know, how, how to kill most efficiently and effectively. And that's very different from the propaganda image, which which needs the chivalry to sell it. It's not about efficient killing when you're selling it to the to the civilian public, presumably. And this is these are some of the self self censorship or possibly externally imposed censorship um, in his memoirs um, that he he gives instances of where he's been chivalrous, but the enemy has not. So, for example, he downs um, a British plane. They're having a nice conversation. And then, you know, the, the British um, observer uh, with the machine gun says, well, you know, I tried to shoot you as you were coming into land, but um, unfortunately my machine gun's jammed. And he says, well, that's very dishonorable. I will now no longer um, try and preserve the lives of, of my enemies. I will take no prisoners. So the justification for behavior that is reported you know where he he shoot he shoots the the planes down and 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 then the pilot is is killed where possibly it was unnecessary is a self preservation thing but i mean there there are all sorts of attempts at reconstruct construction um afterwards where von richthofen is seen as the old guard the more honorable man who is being taken over by quite a different type so you get um, the representation of um, Goering, for example, or Goering-like figures as you know, someone who will take pleasure in shooting um, at civilians, shooting at nurses when they come out to try and help the, the injured. Uh, and that is not the way uh, von Richthofen likes to be seen or you know, people who are constructing him as a hero present him as someone. We shoot planes, not pilots. I think he's one of the 
memorable lines from the film. From the film. I wondered actually if you look at English speaking literature, if he, if he's not really. He, Rather than being chivalrous, the, it's the it's the English the chivalrous, and he's the dastardly, ungentlemanly type. You know, he turns up with his fine circus and has the cheek to bring lots of planes to attack us when we've only got you know a small number. And can you imagine all those? And then if you look at Snoopy, Snoopy's barely taken off. What a swine! Snoopy barely taken off, and the Red Baron's shot his shot his plane up in uh, Snoopy and the Red Baron, and that 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 the recurring almost the recurring joke joke in those Snoopy and the Red Baron uh, strips that the Red Baron gets it and he's cunning, and Snoopy's damn you Red Baron sneaking up on me like that. It's it's cunning. And the Biggles narrative is the same, isn't it? It's always the the slightly ungentlemanly German. Um, I was going to say that using uh, Snoopy and there's a weird extra side element to Biggles just quickly when you were talking about Van Von Richthofen not looking like a you know a super handsome guy he's a guy who's seen warfare and like that is the first time impression of Biggles that we get when Biggles is written about as this kind of pale shaking shell-shocked young man um, and we we envisage him now to be this kind of daring do um, chap but if we use you know Snoopy and Biggles and other things like that Von Richthofen is a cartoon villain. He is the guy who turns up every week with his with his with his henchmen, and they get foiled by the plucky Brits. And then, would you believe it? Von Richthofen gets away, but don't worry, he'll be back next week with a new cunning plan to win the war. But 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 it occurs to me that you know all the stuff you've been saying about his rehabilitation by the Nazis. Presumably, that's a post Second World War in some ways, post-Second World War understanding, because, of course, Biggles starts in the First World War, but definitely gets revitalized in the Second World War, which which really emphasizes the the those Nazi associations that enables the Nazis to become the cartoon villains, as they do in a lot of those military comics from the 1950s, right? So, so he's become not a First World War cultural figure, even though that is his war, but very much a Second World War cultural figure, not just for the Germans, but for the British as well, which, and even the Americans, if we take Snoopy. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I haven't watched it for a long time and I wouldn't recommend anyone else did, but there's a film called The Revenge of the Red Baron with Mickey Rooney. And it, the Red Baron is reincarnated as a toy, um, but he's out for revenge beyond the grave on the ancestors of uh, whoever shot him down. So I mean this this idea that uh, he's just this this ball of hatred um, and animosity. He's almost like the, the Terminator. He is very very hard, except without the humanity. He's very hard to kill, and um, he he will bear a grudge even beyond the grave. But it's it's totally ludicrous. Did that lead to a lot of Australian machine gunners desperately trying to unclaim the fact that their family member had shot the Red Baron down? I, I really have tried to excise it from my mind. I'd be really. I'd be I'd be really interested in hearing about how he's presented in computer games. Well, uh, do, I mean, do, do you want to go? Do you want to? I, I thought you think you were about to have a point, Jessica, before I, I drag us down to my level. No, well, I, I, I was I was just saying that sounds awfully like, um, was it Child's Play or Friday the 13th in one of those 1980s horror films crossed with British popular, you know, uh, 1950s uh, war comics. It sounds dreadful. <laughs> The, ha- the haunted doll trope, but with the Red Baron. I mean, it's ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. That might, well, that might challenge the fact that in America there is a Red Baron pizza company. So Re- the Red Baron appears on pizza boxes in um, America. They're bad pizzas, but I, 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 I bought one when I was in um, Kansas City in like I don't know 2016 or something like that because it's like well. It's got the red baron on it. How can I not do this? And also, I like to think it's what he would have wanted. Um, that this is how he would have chosen to be remembered in the years following his death. There's loads of weird stuff about flying games in computer games in regards to... Firstly, they they lean very heavily into the chivalrous aspect. They're all called things like Knights of the Air or the Chivalrous Flying Man or, you know, it's other in deeply convoluted titles and... The first computer games about either of the two world wars were First World War flight simulators. And the First World War appears in computer games before the Second World War does. And partly that's a technological thing. You know, it's super easy to make a little stick biplane on, you know, a computer with the power of a toaster in the 1970s or or something like that. And you don't have to worry about 
you know, creating human figures. But that also then leads into that 2008 quote, we, we shoot at planes, not pilots, because there are no pilots. You can't see them. They don't exist. You just aim and shoot at the at the machine. And that does that that has a has a role to play as well. But the Red Baron often appears in, you know, the games that he does appear in as like a, the, the boss at the end. You know, he is the thing that all roads lead to. Eventually you'll get into a, a fight with with the Red Baron um, and it becomes a, a, a test of your kind of martial computer game prowess. Can you can you deal with the Red Baron? Can you um, shoot him down? I think I don't think he often dies, although sometimes they kind of mirror slightly onto real world events. So him getting killed in April 1918 it turns out that you did it rather than some opportunistic machine gunner on the ground or or something along those lines but there's a computer game and I think it is called something like Knights of the Air or the Red Baron there are loads of games called the Red Baron that it had a mode in it that I mean it was a really buggy game but um, basically you could go into the options and make it easier because you know flying a First World War fighter plane apparently at the time was really hard um, and it doesn't become any easier when you try and do it on your computer. There's a historian called Adam Wackerfuss who first noted this, that the audience response to this was people lost their minds in a sense of by making it easier to fly these First World War simulated planes, you are disrespecting the memory of those who flew them in the war at the time um, and therefore you're cheapening their their actions and their sacrifice. I mean, firstly, that is so weird, like deeply, deeply weird from the audience. But the Red Baron exists as this placeholder of skill. Computer games like this are always about playing to the, to the intellectual ego of the player. Um, you know, are you a better fighter pilot than the Red Baron? Can you do this better than, you know, this heavily recognisable figure can? And you end up kind of interacting with the myth in that sense. You know, he's the benchmark for quality flyer and skilled killer. But also, you know, he's honourable and chivalrous because if he isn't, then we're not. And we don't want to be stone cold computer game killers. We want there to be some meaning to what we're doing. So if, if we look at I mean, you look at computer games now, we've, we've leapt forward on the timeline. If we look into his rehabilitation, I get, get we've kept alluding to the... Uh, 2008 film haven't we which very much i think re- attempts to and it's a it is a german film isn't it a german produced film because i just find it all very hello hello and then when they put english actors in they make them speak in a fake european accent and then they got completely confused with their fake with their you know if he's a is, is he a is he a lieutenant a lieutenant we're german but we're going to call him a left a lieutenant if you're following yeah, the fake joke, anyway, anyway um, but he's very much reinvented as more of that victim <laughs> of the war, isn't he? What, what, why, why are we reinventing him? Why, why in Germany is he? Is it does he? Does he come back as a as a different type of hero? You know, it's almost the, the revenge of the, the the Red Baron again. It's it's very it's very difficult to make a film about a German war hero uh, and someone like the Red Baron, um, what they're trying to do is go back to the roots before the Nazis instrumentalized him. So the idea that the Nazis were rehabilitating him while they were appropriating him. And, um, you know, he's, but in this film, he's got all the qualities that um, you, we're looking for in a, in a modern day hero. I mean, his his gender politics. He's, he's quite sensitive, even in the brothel scene. He's not really shown as um, you know exploiting the 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 young French ladies like the people around him. You know he's shown as being chivalrous. He just wants to fly. So the idea that flying for him is freedom and it's all a bit of a game. But he's very European. I mean, it, it's quite heavy handed as well. So they they offer each other French cigarettes and they say merci instead of thank you or danke or, or, or whatever. And the first time we we see them, he, he's he's dropping a wreath on um, on a, a fallen enemy with whom one of them has family ties. Oh well, I went to school with him; he's related to me. So it's a sort of it's been described as a German flavored Euro pudding. I I, th- I think the the idea is that. Um, 
he's not uniquely German. They are not constructing him as a German hero. They are constructing him as a European hero who belongs to you know this aristocratic world, which is uh, not as rooted in individual uh, national contexts. I mean, you know, I think we talked about la, la grande uh, illusion uh, as well. So where they have more in common with other aristocrats from France and from Britain than they do with the working classes of, of their own countries. Just trying to remember the date of that film Silent Night, which was also very much the First World War as European project, rather mm-hmm. oddly. Yeah, and, and that, that was in multi-languages as well. Was that, was that, was that the same time? Um, it was a Joyeux Noël, wasn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, 2005 around around the same time and it was um i've forgotten his first name but the brul who who played the german officer uh spoke in english he spoke in french and i think this almost a denial of the germanness of manfred von richthofen is an enormous part of reconstructing him as a possible war hero the the only kind of possible war hero you could you could have is you know it is a a new 21st century new man who has european roots he is suave he is sophisticated uh he is so not anti-semitic i mean it's it's ridiculous how um much trouble they go to to make sure that the jewish Pilot. They 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 had many um, pilots who were um, of, of Jewish origin, but not flying in this particular staffer. But you know, he's saying you know um, with almost every word, you know, look at me, I'm being Jewish, and everyone else is saying that's fine. We love you more than we love anyone else. And when you die, I will go off into you know a, a, a nervous breakdown because of my great personal love for you because I'm so not anti-Semitic. You know, it's almost as if all the Nazi stuff has been washed out. That's not who Manfred von Richthofen is. And we're going back to basics. Who was he? He was, you know, a lovely young man who was put in an impossible situation. He thought he was flying for freedom. He thought he was going hunting. But it took a woman to show him that what he was doing was killing people. And he couldn't live with that you know, because he was so sensitive and he was capable of great love as well. You know, he is a lovely, lovely boy, but bearing almost no relationship to you know, the, the way the way the historical um, Richthofen was, was constructed before. I mean, I was going to say this is, you know, as, as the historian of, of, of heroism, it's, this is a very different vision of the hero, isn't it? Separated by 100 years or 90 years. I was about to say this. This, I mean, it sounds like I'm just, you know, desperately trying to make a job for sort of in the future. That centenary's gone past. But bearing in mind that you know, Joy You Know Well comes out 2005. This film comes out 2008. I wonder whether or not has anybody actually done any work on the 90th anniversary period of the First World War? It's the first anniversaries are in the 21st century, which you know draws a fairly significant gap over what had previously been you know a vaguely contemporaneous time period and whether or not there is something going on in a in attempt to europeanize the response to the 90th anniversary of the of the war i do remember at this time because so i was i was doing my phd just before and and during this period um and first of all i remember going to a conference um organized by dan todman which was what are historians going to do with centenary in a decade's time because hopefully we'll all still be working during that period which which most of us were actually at that conference luckily but i i took a trip to the verdun battlefields and front and center at the gift shop at the ossuary was that postcard of the the french soldier and the german soldier embracing over a cross, which I think is, is a contemporaneous uh, commemoration of, of the armistice. Um, and I can't remember what, but it's in both French and German. And that, that was very much what the gift shop was, was selling, that image of European reconciliation. Because Dumont has 
French, German, and, Euro- and the European Union flag flying above it in, perp- in perpetuity. I mean, that's that's very very much from the point of view of um, uh, uh, the the German perspective. Is that the First World War is is not a great war for them to commemorate, but it is seen as the start of German democracy. Um, so that's something positive uh, to come out of a uh, you know, very very difficult time. Um, and it's also seen as the start of closer relations with the European Union. Um, it does require seeing the whole National Socialist se- sequence of events in the Second World War as a blip. You know that the democratic the democratic tradition started during this time and then continues to the present day. There is an unbroken link, and the commemorations of the centenary certainly were very much designed as European commemorations and losing the specific German patriotism. German patriotism is not something that you can celebrate. So it's more a, a, a Europeanness. It's more, um, you know, a general humanity that uh, the Red Baron is is being made to represent here. He's not a specifically German hero. He doesn't talk about love of a specific fatherland. He 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 talks about try, you know. It's almost like I'm trying to do the right thing here. But that point about the the national socialism is a blip, and the Second World War is a blip, really reinforces the extent to which von Richthofen is a blank slate on which are projected these publicity images, you know, the, the, um, the First World War hero, the Nazi hero, and then the European hero. And that's fascinating that, that in all three periods that we've discussed, who he is, I, it, this is going back to Angus's original question, right? You know, who is von Richthofen? And I think, you know, what our discussion is showing is that he is what we project onto him or what has been projected onto him by culture. And it's really hard to grasp, you know, outside of that, that, that manual uh, of how, how, to, how to fly and kill your enemy, that, that there's actually, we, we, we only have the cultural representation of him and that changes over time. He's a really interesting way of, of looking at that. And the, the, fact, the fact that he didn't survive to see the end of the war um, as well means that you can project all sorts of possible attitudes onto him that are because of his class background because of his upbringing are very unlikely I mean his mother writes about the revolution as if you know these are not the true Germans you know my boys represent the true Germany and you know the simple soldier that worships at the shrine that I have now built for for, for my famous son um, that is the true Germany, and that spirit will return because, you know, as, as, as I said earlier, there wasn't a hugely obvious place for a, a war hero uh, in post-war Germany after the the revolution um, of 1918. And I think the, the, the fate of, of Lothar von Richthofen, um, he didn't have an obvious place to fit in with with the new society. And he took a job as a commercial pilot. And when when he died in 1922, his name wasn't even reported. You, you would have thought that that would have been interesting, but it was not. Um, it, it was reported that he was carrying, um, you know, a, a screen star, a cinematic star, uh, and she was injured in the crash. And so his name wasn't mentioned at all until much later. I think because he didn't survive. You can project all these uh, possible attitudes onto him. Oh, he would have been a national socialist. He was a national socialist through and through. How can you say that? No, he was a European. You know, in fact, he was anti-war. And I think that there there is an element. Um, you know, at the end of the film, we don't see his death, but we do see him flying off and taking uh, his leave of um, the, the the nurse almost as if he is willing to die and wanting to die to show the front soldier that the cause is hopeless. And, you know, are we to believe that von Richthofen wanted there to be a revolution, that he, in fact, deliberately went to his death to say, you know, you have no more heroes? Uh, I mean, I'm definitely 
reading an awful lot into um, his his wave of farewell. But it does seem that he he goes off knowingly um, to to his death and say, you know, as long as I'm flying, as long as I'm the hero, then so many more people will die because they will think that it's not hopeless. If I die, they will see that it's hopeless, and that will save a lot of lives. But I think, you know, for me, I'm picking picking up on on that heat. Well, with his, with his wave of, fa- of farewell, and that we're over an hour. <laughs> 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 shall shall we wave? Shall we wave farewell? I, I almost think we could re- revisit. Certainly, looking at the, you know, heroism and the centenary uh, would be a great topic to 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 revisit at some some point and, and, and go over some of this again. Um, what are we looking at next time, Chris? Do we know? I, I'm not sure if we I have not. I, to be honest. I'm almost just tempted to say Snoopy and the Red Baron because I don't know what else to say. I've been saying it for for, for all of our episodes. <laughs> well, jo- well, perhaps we're going to be looking at John Buchan as I've now bought the the, 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 the amalgamated works on a Kindle for 49p. I've got the audio books. I'm, I'm a, 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 we, 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 could, we, could, we could ask the audience to do, do a their summer reading. Beat read. It makes a very good beat read, can I just say. Well, um, they, that, that's me then in uh, three weeks' time in Spain, beach reading. Now, Chris, you've been busy with some non-First World War related work, uh, which we better give a plug to on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, because I never talk about Star Wars um, when, I'm, <laughs> when I'm here and desperately try and crowbar it into whatever it is that we're talking about. That doesn't sound like me at all. So, uh, yeah, I've, my, my, um, my Routledge academic book, the, the History and Politics of Star Wars, Death Stars and Democracy, something that I have been toiling over for what feels like most of the years of my life, um, is imminent now. It is being published um, around, or at the moment slated to be the 11th of August, um, and I'm having an online book launch for it on Saturday the 13th of August, timed for something like 7pm English time so that people in America can come along to it. If people want to venture from the Oh What A Lovely podcast Twitter account over to my Twitter account, um, the, the details for that are kind of pinned on there at the moment. People are, are more than welcome to come we'll along, put, but equally... We'll put links in the show notes. Oh, yeah, we can put it in there. Um, but equally, yeah, you know, if I, again, similar to, I imagine, you and you and Jessica Angus, that, you know, most of the viewers or the listeners have, have had enough of me talking about Star Wars. And I, I doubt it. I, I like the fact that it's a, a history of politics of Star Wars from the... Uh, Routledge studies in modern history, which makes it feel like it's come back from the future and landed with us yep. after the event has happened. Timelines are all relative uh, in the Star Wars universe. History, politics, of Star Wars, Death of Stars, and democracy. Everyone needs to be pre-ordering. Uh, or if you know, if people want to buy four, five, or six copies each, that would help <laughs> me a lot. Right. With that, thank you, Ingrid. That was great fun. Um, really good fun. I've enjoyed reading Biggles and watching the Red Baron and reading Snoopy. Yeah, well, thanks for having me along. I, I enjoyed uh, get, getting getting to grips with them um, or trying to get to grips with the real Manfred from the East Orphan and finding it to be very slippery indeed. Yeah, I didn't enjoy watching the Red Baron film quite as much. It, it is worse than the King. <laughs> oh, oh, right. <laughs> right, we'll leave grumbling away. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.